Go ahead and open your Bibles to Luke 24. You remember last week we talked about the threefold proclamation of the church that goes forth, especially during Passion Week, and it's this. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. So Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. So let's try that. You're going to do died, risen, come again. I know I'm like pointing at y'all and you're like, what? So you ready? Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Now that's pretty sad. We got to have a little bit better witness. Let's do it one more time like you mean it. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. That's the threefold proclamation of the gospel. Last week we looked at Christ has died. This week we're going to look at Christ is risen. And in Luke 24, I'm going to read just a section and we're going to jump in. Now, on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they and certain other women with them came to the tomb, bringing the spices which they had prepared. But they had found the stone rolled away from the tomb. Then they went in and did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. And it happens as they were greatly perplexed about this, that behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. Then as they were afraid and bowed their faces to the earth, they said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here. He is risen. Remember how he spoke to you when he was in Galilee, saying the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men, men and be crucified, and the third day will rise again. And they remembered his words. So, Father, we thank you. We bless you. We magnify you. We thank you for your son, Jesus. We thank you for his death. We thank you for his resurrection. We thank you that he is seated at your right hand and you're subduing all his enemies and making them a footstool underneath his feet. We thank you he will come again and make all things new. So, Father, send Holy Spirit. He's the teacher. We're the students. We want to learn from him. So teach us your word by the Spirit in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, one question and seven words. So one question and seven words put everyone on notice that something just changed. Something changed in the human experience that would not go back. One question. Why are you seeking the living among the dead? He is not here. He's risen. The angels are standing in a cemetery asking a very strange question. <laughs> well, where else are you going to seek the dead? but in a cemetery, but he's putting everyone on notice that the beginning of the resurrection has begun. Death has lost its sting. That's the announcement. New creation has begun. Redemption has started. What everyone thought was impossible just took place. History has shifted. In fact, Few things are more constant. I'll just say it. Even fewer are certain than death. Death is the one constant that you and I can depend on about our life. You will die. In fact, cemeteries all over the world testify to this reality. Death is coming as soon as you're born. It's on its way. In fact, Benjamin Franklin once said, in this world, nothing can be said to be certain except for death and taxes. Death and taxes. Well, the Bible informs us that death entered the world through humanity's sin and that the wages of our sin is death. In fact, Hebrews chapter 9 makes very clear it's appointed unto man to die once and give account to God. It's appointed. It's appointed. In fact, the Bible informs us on the tragic day when Adam and Eve sinned, 
and spiritual and physical death entered the human experience. In fact, if you think about it, today, without getting too drab, you're like, Alan, this is Resurrection Sunday. You're, you're talking about death. And yet today, the grave will open its mouth and 150,000 people will be swallowed. Now, I want you to let that sink in for a moment. Today, 150,000 people will die. Tomorrow, another 150,000. The next day, another 150,000. Now, if you had, for a week on the news, an earthquake hit and 150,000 people died, you would be distraught. If the next day, a hurricane hit, 150,000 people died. The next day, a volcano struck, another 150,000 people died. And you went through a week of 150,000 people dying every day of tragedy. You would be shocked. There will be vigils all over the world. What's happening? The end's coming. And yet I want to say today, Sheol will open its mouth and 150,000 people will go down to the depths of the belly of the beast. Today. And tomorrow will be the same. The next day will be the same. And Hebrews chapter 9 tells us it's been appointed unto man to die once and give account to God. You know, in the garden, God said very clearly, He created His most prized creation, His beloved humanity, those made in this image, and He gave them the dignity of freely choosing Him. If you choose me, you walk in communion with me, and you have everlasting blessing. But if you choose to go your own way, Know that on the day you do, you will die. And on that tragic day, the Bible records that physical and spiritual death entered the human experience. And since that time, there's been one impending principle. Whoever goes in does not come out. Whoever goes in does not come out. Until. The angels put on notice. One did. Someone came out. And stayed out. Lazarus came out and then went back in. The little girl that was raised came out, then she went back in. But they went back in. But on this day, the angel said, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here. He's risen. And you might say, Alan, so what? Death has billions. Humanity's got one. But the Bible tells us that this man was unlike any other man because this was the heavenly man. This man came from heaven. God, in the flesh, lived a perfect life, died an atoning death for our sin, and then three days later, broke the power of death and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. And now there's a season of amnesty that whoever believes in him would not perish but would have everlasting life. The Bible says he will come one day and when he returns, he will shout and all the graves will open. Some to everlasting life. Some to condemnation. But one man had done the unthinkable. He rose. And this man brought with him everlasting life. This is good news. This is great news because what looked like tragedy on Friday became the greatest news on Sunday. I love what E. Stanley Jones said. He said, if Good Friday raised the questions, then Easter Sunday raised the man, and the raised man is the answer to all the raised questions. I'm going to say that again because I, I hardly got one hallelujah on that great quote <laughs> that I worked so hard to get. Thank you. 
if Good Friday raised the question, then Easter Sunday raised the man, and the raised man is the answer to all the raised questions. Hallelujah. Jesus' resurrection was historical, it was physical, and it was permanent. The church has maintained those three things. It was historical, it was physical, it was permanent. It took place in history. He did not appear to rise from the dead, having a spiritual body. It was the same Jesus who died in the flesh. He rose physically from the dead. He physically rose from the dead and now he keeps his humanity forever that when you interact with God, the Son, you will interact with him in your frame forever. Isn't that great news? Now the, the Bible tells us very clearly on that day when we approach the judgment seat of Christ, we will not see an energy force. It will not be some energy force. We do our little circle thing. Harmonize with the buzz of the universe. No, the Bible says we will see a man with a warm smile and bright eyes. And you will be so glad that your God has come in your frame to make himself known forever. It's historical, it's physical, it's permanent. Christianity claims that the resurrection was not merely Jesus appearing as an eternal spirit was also not a spiritual resurrection in the hearts of the disciples. The apostles declare that Jesus in real time and space rose from the dead with a physical body and appeared in the flesh to a multitude of people. You see, redemption for Christianity is not an escape from death. Most people want to escape death. But that's not redemption for a Christian. Redemption for a Christian is not escaping death. It's destroying death by going through death it's the overcoming in fact it's what the apostles called the fish hook theory that jesus came god came in the flesh because in his humanity he could he could die and in his divinity he could destroy death that was the theory that god needed flesh to make atonement for us for dying our death bearing the penalty for sin displaying the love of the Father, that in his humanity he could die, and in his divinity he could destroy it from the inside out. How many of you have gone fishing, and you put the bait on the hook, and that big 20-pound, 30-pound catfish swallows the bait? And when that, when that fish swallows the bait, every real fisherman knows that fish is mine. Why? Because if you hook it in the mouth, it's got fight. You hook it in the gut, and it loses its will. Because that hook starts tearing from the inside out. That is where they got the fish hook theory, that Jesus, God, came in the flesh, and the divinity was the hook. And they put the humanity around that hook, so that when the devil struck, he swallowed the bait. <laughs> That's why the Bible says, if he would have known, he would not have killed the Lord of glory. But he struck him. If you let him live, he takes over the world. You kill him, he raises everybody else up. He's in a catch-22, but he took the bait. He killed, he struck the son of glory and swallowed in Sheol, swallowed up the God-man. And down in the belly of the beast, the divinity could not die. <laughs> and from within he destroyed death from the inside and came out with the keys of death and hell and now one man controls who dies who lives and he happens to be your brother not just <laughs> hallelujah not to it Redemption for the Christian is not escaping death. Most people are trying. Redemption for the Christian is the conquest of death through resurrection. I remember there's one story of a, of a saint who his wife kept dying and he would raise her from the dead. He'd pray for her and she'd come back three times. Finally, she said, hey, leave me alone. I've seen the Lord. 
Let me die. <laughs> Just leave me alone. I've seen the Lord. Quit, quit praying for me. I'll see you at the resurrection. And he stopped and let her die. <laughs> you see, the word for resurrection in the Greek is anastasis. And the reason why that means something for us is every religion, most ideologies have a, have a view that there's life after death. As every, every religion has a view of life after death, but it's an immaterial state. Anastasis doesn't mean, resurrection doesn't mean life after death. The Greek word means life after life after death. It's life after life after death. This was unheard of in the ancient world. The Jews thought there would be life after life after death, but it would happen on the last day. But before the last day, it broke in on that day. And on that day, the first fruit of the resurrection, Jesus put everyone on notice. What's coming? It's life after life after death. Hold us. Here, I want, to, I want to make two points, and then I'm going to go into a specific purpose this morning. The first point is this. Out of the four religions based on a personality, not just a code of ethics or philosophical construct, only one of those four has a founder who claimed he would rise from the dead and then did it. Muhammad has a grave. Joseph Smith has a grave with bones in it. Jesus does not. That's not a cocky statement. I'm just saying, as far as theologically, there's only one founder of one religion that said he would die and then rise again. In fact, there's only one reason that can explain why disciples, Jewish disciples, came out of hiding and declared such an improbable claim that God came in the form of a man, died on the cross for the forgiveness of the sins, started a global religion with now approximately 2 billion followers, and the founder came out of the grave and remained out. That's the only reason for it. In fact, the resurrection is at the very core of the Christian faith. We're the resurrection people. We believe in the resurrection from the dead, and only in as much as the resurrection is validated can Christianity stand or fall. It was the resurrection that brought us into the wrestle with who is this man, Jesus? And why does he receive worship? And why do angels obey him? And how can he command the natural elements? And how could his life atone for the sin of humanity? And how could he live a perfect life? How, who is this God? In fact, Peter Lewis says this. He says, without the resurrection, Christianity would have been stillborn. For living faith cannot survive a dead Savior. Without Jesus' resurrection from the dead, the tenets of Christianity would be impossible to maintain. In fact, William Lane Craig made a similar point, saying it is difficult to exaggerate what a devastating effect the crucifixion must have had on the disciples. They had no conception of a dying, much less a rising Messiah, for the Messiah would reign forever. Without proper belief in the resurrection, belief in Jesus as Messiah would have been impossible in light of his death. The resurrection turned catastrophe into victory. It was his resurrection that enabled Jesus' shameful death to be interpreted in salvific terms. Without it, Jesus' death would have meant only humiliation and accursedness by God. But in view of the resurrection, it could be seen to be the event by which the forgiveness of sins was obtained. Without the resurrection, the Christian way could have never come into being. In fact, Jesus' own messianic claims, he attached them to the resurrection. As early as John chapter 2, he walked, he, he braided a rope, he walked into the temple, he drove out the money changers, and as he cleansed the temple, the religious leader said, who do you think you are that you can do this? Are you the messenger of the covenant from Malachi that said he would cleanse the priesthood like a refiner's fire and a launderer's soap? 
You better be the Messiah if you're coming in here doing this. You don't have authority to cleanse this temple right here. Who do you think you are? And what sign will you show us that you're the Messiah? He said, easy. I'll destroy this temple and I'll raise it up in three days. They asked him again later at the end of his ministry, what sign will you give us to show us you're the Messiah? He said, I'll give you the sign of Jonah. As Jonah was in the belly of the well for three days and three nights, so too the Son of Man shall be in the belly of the earth and then rise again. Let me ask you a question. What religious leader in all of human history has staked that the truth of everything he says is dependent on when I die, I'll come out of the grave. What other religious leader has said, you're going to know everything I've said is true, one sign, when I go into the grave, when they kill me and I bleed out on that cross, I'll rise again. Beloved, if I stood up here and told y'all, let me tell you something. You will know that what I teach at Open Door Church, <laughs> I'm going to be killed and then in three days I'll rise again. Told you so. <laughs> you should not come back next week. You should run for your life. And yet Jesus stood up and said at the very beginning of his ministry, not just at the end, he bookended it at the very beginning. His first public act in Jerusalem said, you're going to know the sign of the Messiah. I'm going to die and then I'm going to rise. No man takes my life. I lay it down. I take it up again. No other religious founder has stake the veracity of his claims on this. Well, I want to do two things this morning as we set this. My goal today, last week, was just to tell you the story of the cross, just to get us back in the story. The resurrection caps that story of the crucifixion and makes it make sense for us, but it also is to give us confidence in the marketplace of ideas. You don't, you don't have to walk around with your head, about, uh, yeah, I'm a Christian. No, you, you should have confidence in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And I'm going to share a few reasons why I think you should have confidence. The first thing is I'm going to tell you the evidence for the resurrection. Then if I'm worth any weight in salt, I will also tell you the arguments against the resurrection. And then... We will, you can decide for yourself whether the resurrection is true. And since most of you have been saying hallelujah all morning and worshiping, you already know it's true. It'll give you confidence so that when you share the gospel, because the evil one's always just trying to steal one thing from you when you tell people about Jesus, your confidence. Your confidence. You have nothing to shrink back from. The cross has been melting hearts from every generation since it's happened. The hardest hearts have bent underneath the message that God is love. The hardest hearts, I've been looking at the cross going, if God sacrifices like this, if God loves like this, I'm in. <laughs> I'm in. And the apostles and everyone who's followed them has been proclaiming the resurrection. Something took place on that day. So I'm going to look at the evidence. I'm going to give you the alternative theories or arguments against it. If it wasn't, if he didn't rise from the dead, what happened? You got to say something. You got to have some explanation if he didn't rise from the dead. <clears throat> so let's look at it. Christianity claims that the resurrection wasn't merely Jesus appearing as spiritual, but he physically rose from the dead, historical, physical, and permanent. We can have confidence in it. The first point of evidence, this, are you with me? Just talk to me, people. We're in the South. Talk to me. I feel like I'm in Europe right here. Come on, talk to me. The first point of evidence is the empty tomb 
stanzas prove for the resurrection. You know, you ought to assume that that's evidence. The empty tomb stands as proof of the resurrection. And, and the reason why I say that, all it would have taken to dispel this upstart myth is for the authorities to get his body and walk it right through the middle of Jerusalem. One body from Joseph's tomb in the testimony would have been over. Think of the problems it caused the Jewish and Roman authorities. One body, that's all you got to produce. One body, it's over, pack it up, go home. That's it. That wouldn't be very hard today to dig up somebody's body that just died three days ago. Wouldn't be very difficult at all. It's important to note that even the enemies of Jesus admit to the empty tomb. Both sets of enemies admitted to the empty tomb. It's a strong evidence. In fact, it's led Tom Anderson, a, a former president of the California Trial Law Lawyers Association, to say this. Let's assume that the written accounts of his appearances to hundreds of people are false. I want to pose a question for us. With an event so well publicized, don't you think it's reasonable that one historian, one eyewitness, one antagonist would record, record for all time that he had seen Christ's dead body? The silence of history is deafening when it comes to the testimony against the resurrection. As we, as we shall see, his opponents don't even argue the fact that the tomb was empty. They conceded. The second thing is the multitude of Jesus' appearances stand as proof of the resurrection. Jesus' resurrection took place early on the third day following his death. Darkness remained, but light was on the horizon. Jesus rose from the dead. And the first person that he saw, let me, I'll just ask you, if you had just risen from the dead, God of God, light of light, King of kings, Lord of lords, who would you appear to first? You read in the gospel accounts that he appears to the most unlikely person. I mean, wouldn't you? Who would you pick? If you were Jesus, you just rose from the dead. I, I mean, I, I would have... I would have liked to just shown up to like Pilate. Yeah. <laughs> what is true? How about the Sanhedrin? Hey. <laughs> I bet you regret that now. You know, or what about what about Caesar? What about you just show up and whisper, hey, there's a new king. <laughs> <laughs> you answer to somebody now. And yet Jesus appears to the ladies. In fact, he's going to appear to one particular lady. He casts seven demons out of her. Her name's Mary Magdalene. She was from the other side of the tracks. And it says that early on that morning, they were going to the tomb. He was already wrapped in 80 pounds of spices, but they had 20 more pounds to go. Sabbath had come. They had to stop. They were coming back to finish the job, put 20 more pounds on his body. And as they came to the tomb early in the morning, suddenly there was an earthquake, according to the Gospel of Matthew, and an angel came down. And it's an interesting thing because the angel is sitting on the stone. It's a large stone. It took many men to roll that stone. The angel is sitting on the stone. And he talks to the ladies, and yet the soldiers are there, and he says, do not fear. Now, the, the inference is, is, hey, you ladies, don't you fear. Hey, you soldiers, you need to fear. <laughs> <laughs> they come to the tomb. They find it empty. Why are you looking for the living among the dead? At that point, at that point, the women begin to leave. They tells him to go tell the disciples he's going to meet them in Galilee. The women leave, but there's one of the women named Mary Magdalene. She, she's so distraught over what's happened, she's not thinking right. Can you imagine this lady after three days? She thought he, she thought he was the Messiah. She had been saved out of a life of sexual exploitation. 
She had been delivered from seven demons and in this once prostitute now had been saved and cleaned up and now her Savior's dead. Can you imagine the, the distress she's in? She doesn't know what's happened. The angels appeared. She doesn't get it. And in that moment, the rest of the women go back. She's still looking. And in that time, we find that there's another side story where James, I mean, John and Peter hear the other women. They run to the tomb to check on it. John, the beloved disciple, leaves us a minor detail in there that he beat Peter to the tomb. <clears throat> I mean, isn't that great? This is a, a fully divine and fully human book. God lets John go, hey, by the we raced to the tomb, and by the way, I beat Peter. Just thought I'd include that for all eternity. But then John stops. Peter rushes in. They see the linens are folded and nicely arranged. They leave in wonderment. She remains, and suddenly there's two angels standing at both sides of where they laid Jesus. Now just picture this. The picture is of the Ark of the Covenant. That the two angels are at the foot and the head with their wings over. And the picture is the mercy seat where Jesus had laid. And at that moment, she's still not cluing in. <clears throat> she's distraught. And at that moment, one of the angels asked her, Woman, whom are you seeking? She asked where they've laid the Lord. Where, is, where have they taken him? At that point, Jesus he can't stand at a distance any longer. He can't leave her in this place. Now, this is a strategic blunder to show up to a group of women. Now, you don't look, don't, don't get mad at me. This isn't misogyny. I'm just saying in the ancient world, for Jesus to appear to women first, their testimony was not received. And yet Jesus goes, I'm picking her. Doesn't matter. He picks Mary and he, here's what's interesting about Jesus. He says the same thing that the angel said. He's the risen Lord. He knows who she's seeking. And yet he asks her. What is that about God that he wants you to ask him? He wants you to articulate you want him. <laughs> I mean, you want that. You're made in his image. You want it. There's no worse feeling when somebody calls you and goes, hey, you want to go somewhere? And you're, you're like, yeah, I, I think I do. And, he get, and the other person goes, yeah, I asked, you know, Ronnie and Billy to come, but they couldn't, so I thought I'd ask you. You're like, mm -mm. change, but I got something. You want to be desired. And Jesus asked her, woman, who are you seeking? She turns around, she thinks he's the gardener, and she thinks he's done something with the body. Now, you got to remember, this woman's from the other side of the tracks. She's about to hurt somebody. She looks at the gardener and she says, hey, I will break your legs. If you did something with that body, I'm going to hurt you. <laughs> you can almost hear Jesus, he's just smiling, he goes... He goes, Mary. And at that point, she goes, Rabboni. Now, that doesn't, that doesn't like touch you, Rabboni, but, it, but it's teacher. She goes, teacher. He goes, oh, it's much more than teacher, Mary. Behold, I go to my father and to your father now. I've removed the barrier, Mary. I've removed the sin that separated you and all of the human race. I've removed everything. Death has lost its sting. You, you don't get it. I'm going to my God and your God, my Father and your Father. Go tell the others.
And she grabs, she goes to grab on his feet and cling to him. He goes, hey, don't do it. There's so much power resting on my body right now. Don't touch me. You'll be joining me if you touch me. I, I'm, I'm the living God. Hey, just go. And she goes and tells them. And the Bible tells us that at that point, Jesus shows up to two on the road to Emmaus. As he tells them, I won't go into that story, but you know it. He causes their hearts to burn. He disguises himself. We don't know if he kept their eyes from seeing him or his shape shifted. Either way, that's cool. That's just awesome. And gives us a little bit of insight into the power of our resurrected bodies that are coming. And when he breaks the bread with them, he's revealed and he vanishes. They don't go back to the apostles and go, he, he vanished. He, he broke the bread. Did, and then he, and then. <laughs> no, did our hearts not burn as we went on the road? And he taught us the scriptures. And then it says he appeared to Peter alone before he appeared to the other 11. We don't have any record of what that looked like. And then he appears to the 11, actually the 10, because Thomas isn't there. And then Thomas goes, I'm not going to believe unless I can put my finger in his hand and my hand in his side. And so the next time Thomas is in the room, they go, we got to get Thomas in the room. They get Thomas in the room and shh, the door is locked. He shows up in the middle of the room and goes, peace be to you. And Thomas goes, my Lord and my, in the Greek, theos, God. He goes, Thomas, you believe because you've seen, but blessed are those who will believe and who have not seen. And at that point, he says, I'm not a ghost. See, touch me. I'm flesh and bones. Touch me. Give me something to eat. He eats fish and honey. I call it the resurrected Lord's diet. Meat and sweets. <laughs> The resurrected, when I tell, I was, I was waiting for Rachel to say something. Rachel looks at me and she goes, yeah, that's the resurrected Lord's diet. When you get a resurrected body, you can go there. <laughs> but as for now, the meats and sweets uh -huh, are self-evident. But he appears. We can walk through how he can pierce over a 40-day period. It says that he then appeared to 500 people at one time. And Paul writes in 1 Corinthians, oh, by the way, just in case you want to go ask them, half of them are still alive. 500 people at one time, over 40 days, he appears to him. And then he appears to James, his little brother. We don't know what happened there, but whatever happened in that place absolutely transformed James. Can you imagine growing up in the shadow of Jesus? He doesn't sin. That's got to be the worst thing for a little brother. I mean, if you're perfect, it's great. But if you're a sinful little brat, that's got to be horrible. Can you imagine how many times you heard Mary go, hey, James, why can't you be more like your big brother? Of which he could have said, why can't we all be more like my big brother? Mom, dad. <laughs> So he, he appears to James. We don't know what was said there, but it was so holy that James would become known as camel knees from the big calluses on his knees because he prayed to his big brother more than anybody else. Isn't that beautiful? Then he appeared to Paul. Saul of Tarsus as one born out of time. Appeared to him on the road to Damascus, knocked him off his horse. He was struck blind after he saw him for a few minutes and appeared to the one who had been giving his life to murdering those who believed in Jesus. His appearances, his multiple appearances, are strong proofs of the resurrection. The third proof, the changed lives of the apostles stand as proof of the resurrection. The apostles, the gospels are clear that the apostles were lived lives of self-interest. They were arguing over whose the greatest, and then after Jesus died, the, the Bible's very clear that they did not believe. They did not understand. They were in disillusion, disillusionment 
and despair. And yet after Jesus comes out of the tomb, they go from cowardice to courage. Peter will tremble before a young girl around a fire and then stand up in front of everybody fearless just within, you know, less than 60 days. The quick change in courage. Their self-sacrifice, they move from arguing over who's the death to self-surrender and sacrifice for the witness of Jesus. You know, after the resurrection, a moral shift takes place. By Acts 15, you don't know who's leading. They argued over who's going to be the leader. And by Acts 15, you're like, where did James come from? Like, who is this guy? Where did he show up? What, what's Peter? Like, you don't know who is in charge because humility pervades the scene. Their martyrdom. And that, that let, me, let me say another point on their self-sacrifice. How could men who preached and lived lives of the highest moral standards have created the basis of their moral construct on such an outlandish and intentional deception? In their martyr martyrdom, even scholars who do not believe in the bodily resurrection of Jesus admit that something powerful had to have happened for the disciples to be willing to die for the witness of the resurrection. Also, the apostles' preaching in Jerusalem stands as proof of the resurrection. Beloved, if you're going to propagate a lie, you don't do it in the city in which he was killed and the bodies in the tomb. You go somewhere else. This wasn't long enough for myths to have come forth. This was just days after. Days after Jesus had been crucified, they stand in the middle of the city that killed him and said he rose from the dead and began to declare it. You and the powers that be crucified the Lord of glory, but God sovereignly allowed you. And they begin to prophesy and proclaim the gospel of Jesus, the good news of Jesus Christ in the resurrection. Also the conversion of Saul of Tarsus to Paul the apostle. What happened on the road to Damascus is very clear that Paul killed Christians, helped kill Christians, imprisoned them, and then his own testimony in Acts chapter 22, verses 1 to 8, he said, I killed them. I persecuted him. I imprisoned him. I was there holding the clothes and agreeing with the death of Stephen, the first martyr. In fact, I was on my way on the road to Damascus to imprison and kill more when suddenly a light came and he showed himself to me as one born out of time. He said, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you? I am Jesus of Nazareth. And I will show you how much you must suffer for my name's sake, and the one that caused the suffering ended up displaying the greatest amount of suffering. <laughs> well, to wrap it up, that's some of the evidence for the resurrection. What's some of the alternative explanations? If you sit here this morning and you're, a, you're, a, a, you know, you're wrestling with this or you're a good thinker, which you should be. You can love the Lord with all your mind. And you're going out, or you're a cynic, and you go, I, you know what, that doesn't convince me. What's your explanation for what happened? We're not talking about divinizing Jesus a hundred years afterward. We're talking about the men who watched him die now begin to proclaim his rising from the dead and that he's the divine son of God. Well, I'm going to give you the top explanations, and then you decide for yourself. The first one is the wrong tomb theory. You women will appreciate this. This position holds that because it was dark, the women went to the wrong tomb. The women messed up the direction. You're laughing at that. That is a serious explanation. The women went to the wrong tomb and found an empty tomb. It was empty. It just was the wrong tomb. But, but every guy knows that that is just outlandish, or every girl knows why. Because girls stop and ask for direction. <laughs> if it was the men, maybe so. 
But everybody knew where the tomb was. In fact, Peter and John confirmed that it was the right tomb and it was empty. The biggest reason, uh, uh, or I'll say this, the fatal flaw of this theory is that Jesus' enemies knew where the tomb was. All they had to do was go and get his body and walk it through the street and it's over. There's also the stolen body theory, which this theory states that either the Roman or Jewish authorities stole the body. Now, this one's unthinkable. Can you imagine all the problems that Christianity caused the Roman Empire and the Jewish authorities? This is unthinkable that they would steal it and hide his body when all they had to do was go get his body and march it through the streets. There's also my favorite one is the swoon theory. Can you say that with me? Swoon. The swoon theory is that Jesus looked like he was dead. This was the plan. This was the plan of the apostles and Jesus, that he was going to some versions of this, that he took a drug, it slowed down his heart, and that as he looked like he was dead, but he wasn't dead, he was laid in the tomb, and as his body laid on that cold stone, it began to revive him. And then he came back to life, you know, a vitality. And then he was, uh, you know, disappeared for all his days after that. And not one person ever saw him. But that's the swoon theory. Now, some, some of you may be old enough. I'm looking at a lot of you or not. It's, it's uh, called the Passover plot, gives this swoon theory. And yet it, it's, a, it's a movie that he took a drug to slow his heart down. And he was going to trick him, but he didn't count on the soldier sticking the spear in his side. So that when they took him to the tomb to bury him, he was still alive, but then he died. The swoon theory. How many of you go, that, that, that's a powerful theory. The argument against this theory is that it was clear Jesus was dead. No one could have survived his injuries, and soldiers were an expert at crucifixion. In fact, they didn't break his legs, which was a sign that he was already dead. And just to make sure, they stabbed him in his side, and the witnesses that blood and water poured out of his lungs. He was dead. Jesus was covered with burial clothes, 80 pounds of spices. So let's say Jesus survived the complete ripping apart to where he no longer looked human. He couldn't carry the cross beam, but he goes to the cross, survives the crucifixion, the spear in the side. They take him down. They wrap him up. He's still alive. He revives. Somehow he unwraps himself from 80 pounds of spices and linen cloth, rolls the stone away by himself, which took many, many men, then fought a Roman guard and then had the strength to walk on the road to Emmaus with two disciples. It's just incredulous. There's also the hallucination theory. Are are you with me? I'm almost done. The theory holds that the resurrection took place in the minds of the disciples as they sat around. They, They thought to themselves, certainly this isn't the end. Certainly it couldn't end this way. And as they sat around and said, it can't end this way. Suddenly they felt as if the presence of the Lord was in their midst. And suddenly they realized it wasn't the end. It was the beginning. And he spiritually rose in all of their hearts. And they went forth and died gruesome deaths because they felt something in a room. There's a big problem with this theory, and it's that hallucinations happen only under certain specific conditions. And one of those conditions are that everybody's expected and really hopeful and happy. You're expected. Well, they weren't expected. And it only happens to individuals. It doesn't happen to groups. And yet Jesus appeared to 500 people at one time. He appeared in a room of 11. He appeared in a room of 10. So it's just hard to imagine this would. And maybe the last one is called the theft theory, which is the one that's prevalent to this day, which is the one when I led my roommate, my Jewish roommate to Jesus is the one his parents told him 
which is that the disciples stole the body. The disciples stole the body. In fact, that's what the scriptures record is that when the soldiers came to the Jewish priests, they were scared. Why? Because a Roman guard that falls asleep and allows that Roman seal to be broken and that body to disappear, they will suffer the death penalty as soldiers. Now they're terrified. They go to the Jewish authorities. The Jewish authorities tell them, say that the body, while you were sleeping, the disciples came and stole the body. We'll pay you and we'll cover for you. If it gets back to Pontius Pilate, we'll cover for you. And that's the story that's been proclaimed to this day. Now, what's the answer to that? There's a couple answers. If the Romans were, were now this is just tongue in cheek. If the Romans were sleeping, then how do they know who stole the body? That's kind of cheeky. But then, two, the possibility of a Roman guard sleeping was highly unlikely. If you fell asleep on the night watch, you would suffer death. It was punishable by death. It's also highly unlikely that disciples would have gathered in one place to strategize such a plot when their lives were on the line and they were scattered. And then the biggest answer to this, if they were not willing to die for their living Lord, why in the world would they be willing to die for their dead Lord? It makes no sense. So Peter will deny him why he's alive, but when he's dead, he'll risk his life then. No, they were going back disillusioned, the road to Emmaus tells us. Here's, here's how I want to end it. Part of my testimony is that I was in a, a Bible school that was very liberal. Um, my professors didn't believe in the resurrection of Jesus. They didn't believe in the scriptures, the resurrection of Jesus, the divinity of Jesus. And I remember um, going through a very hard time for about two years wrestling with my faith and studying world religions and, what, and wondering what's the meaning of life. And I remember as I was walking across uh, between the tennis courts and the girl dorms on the way to the religion department, as I was walking through this grass field, suddenly, where I hadn't felt the presence of the Lord in years, as I was wrestling, I felt a touch on my shoulder and heard a voice say, it's okay, Alan, I'm here. And at that moment, I can't explain it, but I was filled, filled with the Holy Spirit. And, and things that I'd wrestled with for two years suddenly made sense. And now I understood the scriptures. And I remember, I remember running across the campus going, He's real! He's real! He's alive! <laughs> and I remember, I could go into more of that, but I won't. But I also remember, but my point is, is, is it's hard to have an apologetic against the living Savior. Because you can be Saul of Tarsus, and the next thing you know, Jesus shows up. Or you can be a Muslim on Ramadan, and next thing you know, you dream about the guy in white, and he shows up. Or you can be like my good friend, my dear friend, Yosef, was a Muslim and was on his deathbed in Indonesia, and he was on his deathbed in Indonesia, and the man in white not only comes in the room, but touches him and prays for him to be healed, and he gets converted and starts planting churches underground all over Indonesia because Jesus came and he wasn't looking for him. What's the apologetic against a risen Lord? I remember I was evangelizing. We, we would go down in Kansas City during Halloween to these scare houses. And this is where I really will end it. After this, I'm just telling you parents who are like, I got to get my kid. Um, we went down to these scare houses to evangelize. And during the Halloween season, Kansas City's downtown warehouse district converts to like the scariest scare houses, like like the edge of hell. One's called the beast. Do you remember, say, do you remember those? They're, they're terrifying. And there would be like warlocks walking around with, rat man do you remember and rats would go in his mouth and all over him and it was scary stuff i mean it was a it was yeah and then but it was a killer making money i mean they charge you 50 bucks to go in for 20 minutes and be scared half to death 
I thought, this is amazing. I tell you, she can make all kinds of money. So because, but I, we would go down and evangelize, and you, we would evangelize people waiting in the line and people coming out. I like to be where they came out. Because when you're evangelizing in the line, they get aggravated. But when they come out, they're freaked out. You know, when the Bible, when it says, it, it literally says in the Bible that the, he will put enmity between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent. There's a natural enmity in you. You don't, Satan, the thought of Satan repulses you. They would come out of these demonic scare houses and they would just be like ready to talk about life. Was like, you know, and so that's when I would want to get them. And we would ask them five questions. We'd ask them very basic questions like on a scale of zero to 10, what would you rate this scare house? And they're scared. They're like 10. Was it worth the money? Some yes, some no. Then we would say, do you believe there's a Satan? And almost every one of them would believe there's a Satan coming out of the scare houses. Then we would ask him, do you believe that God exists? Now, this was terrifying. About half of them would say no. Can you imagine if you believe Satan exists, but God did not? Like, what kind of hell are you living in? I mean, yeah, you wouldn't even make up something that horrible. Yeah, I'm part of a world where there's an a evil, purely evil being and nothing to check him. You're in trouble. But we'd ask, if, do you believe God exists? And then we'd say, what do you believe heaven exists? And if it does, how do you plan on getting there? And that would create the thing. And I remember this one girl, she came out with a group of young people. She was probably in her mid-20s. and She was vivacious, and you could tell she was just bright, and she had all these kids that had gone in there. She came out, and they were just, oh, my gosh. And so I began the, you know, the survey with her, and I got down to, do you believe in God? And and it was pretty much no, but do you believe? She goes, I believe in a high, higher power of some sort of reality. I said, do you believe in heaven? And, and if so, how do you plan to get there? She goes, oh yeah, I believe in heaven. I believe there's fields of existence. There's fields of existence. And you can go to different fields. When you die, you go to different levels of existence, which is life after death. It's not life after life after death, but it's life after death. And I'm like, that's interesting. I, I, like Elysium Fields or what? Well, like, explain these fields to me. She goes, yeah, you see how you're going to get there. And she starts evangelizing me. She's like, how you're going to get there is you got to fulfill your goals. And the better you fulfill your goals depends on what field you go to in the next thing. So I go, oh, interesting. So if you do like 30% of your goals, you go to this field, 60% that field, 90% that field, like fields, fields. And I go, so it's based on goals. She goes, yes, every individual and their goals. I go, so if your goal is to exterminate the Jewish race and you do a good job of it. Because you know where I'm going, everybody uses Hitler, which you shouldn't. But it is, it's like, so if your goal is to kill the human race called the final solution and you get six million of them. And at that point, all the little kids around me are going. <laughs> and she's caught. I'm not trying to catch her. I'm, I'm honestly, humbly asking her, like, are there good goals and bad goals? And as long as they're goal, you're in it? Like bad goals? Like my goal is to kill a genocide. My goal is genocide. And I'm pretty good at it. So, like, Hitler's going to be way up there. And all the kids are going, mm-mm, Hitler ain't making it. And she's caught. She goes, well, well yeah. Well, why, how do you believe you're going to get there? And I said, you know what? That's a great question. I said, I'm not. Oh, oh, I first asked her. She goes, oh, yeah. And I go, I go where, did you, where did you get this from? And she goes, well, I got it on the internet. I went to different sites and then I kind of pieced it together and and put it together. And that that's what I think. I go, I go, really? I go, you're going to base your eternal existence 
on a couple internet site. And she, I, she started to turn and see, and she goes, what are you going to base your, etern your eternal existence upon? And I went, oh, I'm so glad you had. I said, I'm going to base it upon a book in which God revealed himself to a people group that has hundreds of prophecies that were fulfilled that culminated in the coming of God in the flesh to tell us exactly what he's like, who lived a sinless life, and then laid down his life and died our death, that when he went to the grave, he broke the power of it and came out of the grave. And one day he's coming again and going to raise everyone up, some to the resurrection of righteousness, others to the resurrection of condemnation. And between now and then, there's a season of amnesty. Whoever calls upon him shall be forgiven as a free gift of God, not of works, lest any should buffs. It's the beautiful God who so loved the world that he gave his only son. And she, she just, she, I, 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 she just screamed at me and ran off. But guess who didn't run off? All the kids. I said, how many of you would like to know that if you're going to, base your eternal existence, your overcoming of the grave, you should probably trust in the only one who's come out and stayed out. Would you like to receive him? Yeah. I remember just going, oh God, oh God. So the question this morning is, the statement is, the question in the statement is, why are you seeking the living among the dead? He is not here. He's risen. Have you considered the evidence of the resurrection? And if you have, have you considered the alternatives? And do they make more sense than the evidence that's interpreted what has happened? And then the final question is this. What are you betting your eternal existence upon? What's going to get you out of the grave? Seeing how it's been appointed that you're going to visit it. <laughs> and the testimony of the apostles through the ages has been Jesus. There's one who's overcome, that whoever calls on him would not perish, but have everlasting life. Amen? 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 Amen. All right, let's stand.